So David just spent an hour yelling at his mom to get vaccinated. (laughs) (laughs) That's why you weren't going to tell me what you were going to say. Yep. Okay. To all the moms out there, go get vaccinated. Your kids need you. My mom is dead from something stupid and preventable. Don't let your kids, grown or not, be able to say the same thing. Get vaccinated. I support that message. Now some exciting news. I got the idea when I saw Genderbender was coming up and it was it just didn't sit right with me. It's an incredibly outdated episode and obviously title. It includes bi erasure. It's incredibly sex negative bananas. For, for what was supposed to be the sexy episode. And it includes an alien who had provoked unwilling partners into sex. You know. Rape. Rape. It was a very difficult episode to watch, but I decided I wanted more queer stories told by queer people, and we have a local group that supports that. So this month, we're donating 10 cents per stream to TIGLF, which is T-I-G-L-F-F, Tampa International Gay and Lesbian Film Festival, whose mission is to showcase a selection of compelling video and film by, for, or about the LGBTQ plus community that entertains, empowers, and enlightens the festival audience. They're a wonderful group with amazing events I hope to attend again soon. Bonus, many of their events are held at the historic Tampa Theater. Great venue. Yes, which is an amazing venue that I also miss dearly. (laughs) So by supporting Teaglyph, we are getting more queer stories. We're supporting the community, local and international, and we're supporting the historic Tampa Theater which I always love to do. It's a win-win-win, as far as I'm concerned. One time, we spent an entire day there watching all of the Nightmare on Elm Streets. It was so good. I want it to be, well, it's open, but I want it to be safe to go. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's so great. We've seen so many great shows there. I've seen podcasts there. I've seen, I saw John Waters there. And we saw Welcome to Night Vale there. Yep. That's where we go see Rocky Horror. Yep. I was really hoping to be able to see it again this year. Mm -hmm. We'll see. So, stream our episodes, any episodes, to help support a wonderful queer cause. You can donate directly also to tglyph.com dash donate. Ultimately, I would love to donate enough to be a movie sponsor. That's $350. (laughs) So, please listen, share, and support. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Also, as she mentioned, bad episode of The X-Files good episode of the cast files yes it was actually much more fun to do than i had initially expected i was dreading recording this yep before we recorded it like right up until before we recorded it It turned out much better than we expected and i actually haven't heard it since you've edited yeah and i'm gonna go ahead and say good job us okay so i guess let's get into the episode let's do it Greetings, listeners, domestic, international, and extraterrestrial. I'm Dave Reed. And I'm Kristen Riley. And this is The Cast Files. I'm a nerd who somehow never saw The X-Files. And I watched it when it originally aired. The Cast Files is a podcast where we are watching and discussing every episode of The X-Files, spoiler-free. Today we're talking about Season 1, Episode 14, Gender Bender. It originally aired January 21st, 1994 to... 11.1 11.1 million people. It was written by Larry Barber and Paul Barber and directed by Rob Bowman. Now immediately, Rob Bowman is a name I recognized. Oh. And I'm thinking, where do I know that from? So I looked him up on IMDb. He directed a bunch of episodes of Castle. Nope. That's, <laughs> that's not where I know him from. He directed a few episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. Nope. That's not where I know him from. Didn't watch that either. He directed a little movie, a little rock and rollerblade movie called Airborne, starring Shane McDermott and Seth Green. I love that Seth Green just pops up in everything. (laughs) It's fantastic. Rob Bowman also, this was his first episode that he directed of The X-Files, and he would go on to direct 33 more episodes. Oh, oh, wow. And he also directed the first feature film, The X-Files, in 1998. Wow. Well... Good job, Rob Bowman. Yep. So we have an opening note for this episode. This episode was difficult to watch in 2021. There's a lot of outdated language, context, and thinking. It's a very moralistic episode for a genre dealing in aliens and monsters of the week. So if you haven't seen it or haven't seen it in a while, 
I feel like skipping it, you're not missing anything. Yeah. So, sorry, Rob. Just listen to us talk about it. <laughs> Don't watch it. We are two cisgendered people who aren't going to pretend we're experts. We don't have the lived experiences or expertise to tackle all of the issues on gender and sexuality in this episode. However, I'd like to note that using gender nonconforming people in horror as evil simply because they are gender nonconforming is lazy. If among you want... Other. What? Uh, among other things. Yes. If you want a queer antagonist or monster or villain, fantastic. Make them more than a one-dimensional character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's all I'm going to say about that. But I do have another area of this episode that made it really hard for me to watch because I do have lived experience in the non-consensual nature of the sex in this episode. Yeah. The creators wanted a sexy episode, and that makes this even more damning. Not a single person in this episode consents to having sex with either Marty or Brother Andrew prior to the thumb magic. Yeah. The favorite drug? They actually say no. Yeah. Everybody says no. And the pheromone excuse is a thin cover for, yes, date rape drugs. Spanish fly. So it's tone deaf at best. I understand this is 1994. I don't, I'm not going to excuse it. So once again, if this is an episode you want to skip, I get it. Now's your chance. I even have a few suggestions. (laughs) If you want a horror set in 1994 with queer characters, Fear Street 1994. (laughs) Do you want a sexy queer horror? Jennifer's body. Do you want queer cinema of a different vibe altogether? Portrait of a Lady on Fire. (laughs) I thought you were going to say, but I'm a cheerleader. Ah, that's good. These were the first three that popped into my head. And I'm glad that you said that because I was going to ask if you had anything. Yes, that's also a real fun one. So we're going to do our best to make this interesting without just screaming into the mics. But wanted to give that up top because it's a very dated episode. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? (sighs) It's got a lot of problems, and I hope to never see Larry Barber and Paul Barber's name on another episode ever again. <laughs> are those the writers? Those are the writers. Uh, I know you just said it, but... Don't know if they're related. Probably. Maybe. Yeah. I know I looked up this at the beginning, ugh, but I watched this three weeks ago, so I've been stressing about this for far too long. All right, so let's just get into it. Okay. IMDb says a religious sect becomes a prime suspect in a murder spree. Sure. Okay. The funny thing is, the first time I watched it, I missed all of that, even though that is the bulk of this, (laughs) because I was so blinded with rage and just being uncomfortable. But that's my deal. Okay, so we're, we're moving on to the cast. Brent Hinckley is Brother Andrew. You may know him from I Married a Centerfold or Carnosaur. <laughs> Carnosaur. I know him from doing one episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer in season six where he works at the Double Meat Palace. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, we also have Michelle Goodger. She is Sister Abigail. You might know her from a little something called Moment of Truth Cult Rescue. <laughs> Was it this episode? (laughs) Or Someone Else's Child. Oh, okay. (laughs) We also have Peter Stebbings, who is Marty. You might know him from G-Spot, which is a TV show. Uh, Oh, okay. It was a literal TV show. Or K-19, The Widowmaker. I've heard of that. That's a submarine movie, isn't it? I have no idea. I didn't look into it. I just thought it was a silly name, especially to go Widowmaker with the G-Spot. We also have Kate Twa, who is also Marty, and she is in Quarantine, and we all fall down. All right, so this episode opens up in a dance club. We've got loud music playing and strobe lights illuminating an otherwise dark club. It's definitely a club. We also have a about 14 minutes of a shot of an eyeball. Intercut with the first person shooter view going up some stairs. Oh god. <laughs> it, it looked like doom. <laughs> There's a young man who is talking to somebody and then she says no and he walks away and he goes over to a video machine to read his horoscope. First and foremost, horoscope machine? Weird enough on its own. Second of all, he's standing at the horoscope machine, dancing and looking at it like it's a jukebox. <laughs> he like he's just like, eh, mm, uh, mm, Leo, uh, 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 Scorpio, uh, uh, uh. huh? I I 
would probably dance in front of a, a horoscope box um, if I was in a club too. But not to this music. This music was <laughs> awful. This music was like a rhythmic baby clanging metal pans on metal pipes. <laughs> At least it's a rhythmic baby. <laughs> <laughs> I had to put that because it was there was a rhythm to it. <laughs> While he's reading and dancing at his horoscope, a young woman comes alongside him and tries to get his attention. He is disinterested. He basically, he blows her off. He shakes his head no. It's he, really loud. He's, he's trying to figure out what's going on with Taurus. Yes, because he was turned down by the woman he was talking to at the bar. Yeah. I tried to read her lips and I couldn't. But it, it looked like something that she said was, come find me. So I'm wondering if she said something like, okay, in 1994, what could she have said? He's hitting on her and she's like, no, something, something, something. Like when you become a oh, okay. Silicon Valley trillionaire, right. come find me. What gotcha. what is What are they saying in 1994? 1994? Oh man, let's see. What was cool when I was in a high school? I know you were dating in 1994, right? No, I was in high school. I did not date in high school. <laughs> I was 11, so I don't know what pickup artists were doing in 1994. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, you're two days away from being 11. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep, I am. You got anything? I got uh, hypercolor t-shirts. <laughs> That's all I can think of. Okay. We can cut that out. That's all fine. <laughs> So he looks disinterested and he looks back at the video screen. She takes his left hand in hers, rubs his hand with her thumb, and suddenly he's very interested in her. He leans over and it looks like he's going to kiss her, but there's a whole lot of these moments where I'm like, are they going to make out just right now? No, but they're all, they're all leaning in close to talk. She whispers something in his ear and they walk away hand in hand. That's the end. The next of that awful dance club. The next scene, we see them in bed. They have just had sex. She gets off the bed fully dressed. <laughs> <laughs> the sex in the sex scene, she is holding his right hand in her right hand. But she's on top of him. So their arms had to have been like <laughs> You're crossed right. over in front of each other. You're right. I knew that scene looked weird for some reason. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's so awkward. The angle was weird. And she's rubbing his whatever part, this fleshy part in between your thumb and forefinger are. And he, so she gets out of bed, again, fully dressed. He's trying to catch his breath. He says, And now for Cast Files Theater. Oh my God, that was, that was incredible. I mean it. You don't believe me. Can you hear me? Hey, I, I don't even know your name. That was Cast Files Theater. <laughs> it's all just, all, it's a lot. He sits up in bed and then starts showing signs of being in pain. She is over in the bathroom. Now she's turned around to watch him die. He coughs and moans, clutching his throat, falls back in bed. Red, pink foam comes out of his mouth and he appears dead. This is the first goof that we have of this episode, though. Okay. Because at about minute 520, he blinks. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say he's dying of cardiac arrest and holding his throat. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Nearby, in the bathroom, the woman drops her lingerie to the floor. So now she's getting undressed. <laughs> well, now's the time. <laughs> I do like this reveal, though, because we zoom down her, pan down her legs. I keep, I've keep i said zoom in so many of these episodes. And I really mean pan, <laughs> so I apologize. They, we pan down with the camera to see her feet on the tile floor. And they she moves her feet so that we're... Focusing on her feet, move the feet so we focus on the feet, and then drops her lingerie. And the next shot, the legs are masculine. So it's definitely feminine calves, and then it's masculine calves in that shot. I kind of liked that. And then we see that person walking, but we don't get a close-up of the face or anything. There's no big reveal, except I was looking at the legs because you were telescoping is that what the word is? You were basically telling me to look at the legs. So I was telegraphing. Telegraphing, thank you. So I was definitely paying attention. And then we when we see the face, it's a man's face. And then he puts on a robe or something, and that's it. Next scene we're at, we're still in the hotel, but now it's a crime scene. Oh, one last thing about the this hotel room. Well, we're still in this hotel room. The sheets are navy blue. Hmm. I've never seen hotel sheets that are dark. It's funny you say that because another podcast I was listening to, The Boogie Monster, was talking about why hotel sheets are white. 
Always. And if you have a hotel sheets that are not white, do not stay at that place. It's so they can just bleach the hell yeah. out of it and kill anything that's on those sheets. Yes. Yeah. They got to heavy duty bleach that. Yep. So if you go to a hotel with blue sheets, don't stay there. No. That's not really clean. You can just clean, you can regular clean your own sheets because you're just laying in your own filth. <laughs> you don't lay in other people's filth. Yeah. Yeah, you heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. She's filthy. <laughs> and I'm filthy? <laughs> you're the one saying lay in your own filth. Fine. Yeah, I couldn't think. I wanted a good joke there. I couldn't come up with that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, so crime scene, hotel room. The crime scene is in Germantown, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C. We meet a Detective Horton. He says, New York businessman calls his wife to say goodnight, then goes out and picks up some chippy. He's a chippy. A trollop. Oh, good. I'm glad we're using these words in 1994. <laughs> he brings her back here for sex. Beyond that, well, nothing makes a whole lot of sense. All of this is garbage. Yeah. If it's supposed to be a sexy episode, why are they so down on sex? It's such an anti-sex episode. All of it. It is. It's crazy. Also, why does he have to be a New York businessman? Yeah. A, mar a married man. Why would he be? <laughs> right. None of this makes sense. He's, he was obviously trying to pick up somebody before he met Marty. So he's out picking up people. I guess it's, oh, he's married cheating, so he deserves it. I wonder if that's, something. it's just real garbage. Because in a minute, Scully will say, hard to imagine in this day and age, someone having sex with a perfect stranger. Yeah. Which is what he was at the club to do. If he's... That's what multiple people in that club are there to do. Oh, yeah. Throughout the episode. And that club appears to be the place to go to pick someone up for a one night stand. Yeah. And in 94, AIDS is still a real big problem. So that has to be what they're talking about. But they don't say it. No. She just is like, oh, this day and age, it's 1994. Why would you have a one night stand in 1994? That doesn't make any sense to me. It do None of it makes sense. And you think this pickup artist in, I'm calling him a pickup artist now. <laughs> he I've, invented it. I've fallen into 1994 speak. Oh God, help us all. So this guy, this businessman calls his wife and then goes out and picks up somebody. Here's the thing. Detective Horton says beyond that, well, nothing makes a lot of sense. And then Scully's like, so who's gonna have who's gonna have a one night stand? And Detective Horton should have come back and been like, "Well, all of the businessmen coming from New York." <laughs> yeah, the, uh, Detective Horton and Scully are diametrically opposed in this. Oh He's my like, gosh! The one night stand makes perfect sense. Everything else, I have no idea. And she's like, "One night stands don't make any sense. People dying weird." Yeah, I get that. <laughs> Oh. On the security cameras in the hotel, they checked the cams, so we see that a man and woman entered, and then a man leaving, but it's a different man than the man and woman entering, apparently. And Scully asks if she could have changed clothes, but Detective Horton says no. The man who left had 30 pounds on her and different hair. She was also 5'6 when she walked in, <laughs> and the person who left was 5'10". Yeah. <laughs> so, whatever. It's just a mess. All right. That's all I have for that scene. Dude's dead. In Mulder's office, they explain pheromones. I think in 2021, we've all heard about pheromones. Yeah, I was shocked that it was in question in 1994. Well, Scully says, well, there's still a question as to whether humans can produce pheromones. So how can that be? And Mulder says, I don't know. But if it's true, then this guy is a walking aphrodisiac. He's the ultimate sex magnet. Yeah. And then he does a hip pump. <laughs> but he was sitting down behind his desk so you couldn't see it. Right. But he did do but it. But he did do it. <laughs> Cannon. Cannon. <laughs> and I have not yet bathed today, so what do you think? My pheromones? Oh, God. You, uh, you feeling that? <laughs> are you, are you wafting yeah. <laughs> the crotch this, smell at me? This is, this is <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of way. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I didn't say it. 
say that kind of way. Oh. <laughs> All right, back to this very important scene. Scully says, he or she, we've got victims of both sexes, both a man and a woman on the hotel security monitor. So now Scully and Mulder have never heard of bisexual people either. Well, that's because it's 1994. Bisexual people have not been invented yet. We all know that bisexual people were invented in 1995. You have to explain that joke, because it's a joke here in the household. <laughs> I know. I figured we'd tweet out the, uh, the cover. The cover? Right? Yeah. Well, you need to explain it for people who don't see it. Okay. Well, was it time? I think it was time. Time magazine did a cover of... Person of the Year? No. Just some issue of Time magazine was like, 1995, Year of the Bisexual, or some crap like that. That's right. (laughs) And so in this household, we have a running joke of that's when bisexual people were invented. Yes. It's all in... It's in good fun. It might not be in good taste, but it's in good fun. (laughs) It is. I just Googled it, and it is not coming up, so I will have to find it. Oh, there's one about cyber porn. Somebody looking real scared. (laughs) Editor's note. It is the July 17th, 1995 cover of the magazine Newsweek. It's got three just generic white people on it. In big letters it says bisexuality. Underneath, not gay, not straight. A new sexual identity emerges. As if bisexuality is brand new. This is why we make fun of this thing all the time. It's just ridiculous and asinine. All right, we'll look for it. I'll tweet it out. All right, so they also discuss the Kindred, a sect of religious isolationists known for their handmade stoneware pottery. The clay is white. This is important for a big reveal at the end. (laughs) It's not important anywhere else. All right, Steveston, Massachusetts is where they're at next. They're going to go talk to the Kindred. Oh, they also said something about the stoneware clay was underneath someone's fingernails and the, so that led them here whatever they didn't just go <laughs> there was there was a sentence in there to to direct us they heard about a religious sect called the kendron where we're, they were like oh that's goth as fuck we need to go <laughs> hi again i'm so very excited to have you here with us i'm even more thrilled than usual because now i get to introduce you to a wonderful indie podcast i love Our friends over at Homicide Worldwide Podcast do a phenomenal job breaking down tough true crime stories and have a good time doing it. So get smarter, have fun, and check out their promo. Hello there. Are you looking for your new favorite true crime podcast? Well, I'm Kita. And I'm Sally. And we are the co-hosts of Homicide Worldwide Podcast. We are two human females (laughs) who like to talk about murder. Every week we get together and we talk about the details, the psychology, and of course, some good smack talk. Join us every Friday for a new episode of Homicide Worldwide. Mulder and Scully speak with the shopkeeper. Scully tells her they're investigating a murder. The shopkeeper says there are no murders around there. There's a bunch of pictures missing on the wall and a man says that the male shopkeeper, because we have a female and a male shopkeeper, uh, the man says that they are being reframed. It looks wild on the wall with the amount of pictures that are down. Yeah. And I have some questions about the pictures in a little bit, but fine. So they're down to be reframed or whatever. Mulder asks about the kindred. The shopkeeper says they keep to themselves. There are rumors around the small town about them, but the shopkeeper, neither of them really have any problem with them because they bring in the tourists. I actually liked this line because it seems real. Yeah. Like, yeah, they don't, they're not bothering anybody and they're bringing in the tourists. Fine. Are they a little odd? Sure. But who cares? Yep. So if I had to pick one thing I liked about this episode, it's the shopkeeper's attitude in this scene. Oh, yay. (laughs) He just showed me his note and apparently he also likes the shopkeeper's. (laughs) All right, so (laughs) the shopkeeper doubles down on the stoneware pottery. They're known for their stoneware pottery and their unusual ways. All right, fine. A group of kindred pull into town, and 
he says that they usually go to the feed store. The shot when they pull into town, just the angle at where it is, it looks like they're pulling a car behind them on horses. Like, they're yeah. using the horses <laughs> to pull the car for just a second. That's but, funny. But it was enough that I had to write it down. That's, like, oh, that's weird. I love, I love when shots get weird on accident. Yeah. Uh, Mulder follows the women into the store after he says something to them and they just ignore his ass. <laughs> He's like, ladies, <laughs> yeah. how's it going? So he goes into the store after them. Scully stays out and talks to Brother Andrew. We'll find out he's Brother Andrew in a, in, later in this scene, so great. And I said, w- why? Why is this how they do this? Wouldn't it make more sense for Mulder to speak to the men and Scully to speak to the women? Because they have already said that this is a very religious sect. They are known for their abstinence and their Christian ways and all of the other things. Wouldn't it make sense? That's a very good point. I didn't think about it, but very good point. It just seemed like, come on, guys. Yeah, I guess Mulder's relying on his charm Charm. to be like, these ladies have never seen a man like me. Little does he know. They've got that finger rubbing thing. Yeah. When Brother Andrew says he's not supposed to speak outside... Scully doesn't take no for an answer. She moves in closer to shake his hand and keep talking to him. He takes her hand and rubs his thumb on hers, like we saw the woman in the opening, and Scully goes into a trance or something. Or something. Yeah. A kindred man calls to Brother Andrew, breaking the connection. Brother Andrew leaves. Mulder asks Scully what she's doing, but she seems out of it and confused because she's just standing there. And after a beat, she says... There's something out there, Mulder. And he replies, oh, I've been saying that for years. (laughs) A little bit of trivia. Steveston is a real town located in Richmond, British Columbia, that also doubles as Storybrook, Maine, in Once Upon a Time from 2011. It's also got a popular diner called Granny's Diner, which is the Canary Cafe in real life, and it's seen in this episode. Wait, oh, is it Granny's Diner in Once Upon a Time? Yes. Okay. I believe that's I believe that's right. Yes, that would make sense. And you can see it behind Mulder and Scully at minute nine and thirty-two seconds. Just in case you're doing the I don't know, you're touring around looking for places. Diners are great. All right, outside Steveston, they pull up in a car. Mulder has a map. It's approximately a mile walk from where they've stopped because they don't have four-wheel drive. Yeah, he looks at it and says, "My horse for a jeep." From Richard III. That's the line from Richard III. Okay. My horse for a Jeep. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. Um, After a while, we get the gif of Mulder crumpling the map and kicking it for Scully to catch. Such a good scene. Yeah. Or, I guess, bit. Such a good bit. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Scully kept her eye on the ball. Made a good catch. That's the best thing about this whole episode. It's that little bit right there. That gif. Yeah. Inside the farm. Oh, whoops. Okay, I skipped ahead. Because I'm ready to be done. (laughs) The kindred show up, surround them, order them to relinquish their weapons. Oh, they step out of nowhere. Yep. It's like they just appeared. Hmm. And Mulder and Scully do relinquish their weapons, which made you really mad until you realized that the agents gave up their magazines and not their loaded weapons. Exactly. They just gave up the magazines and kept the weapons themselves, which, if they're smart, they've got one in the chamber (laughs) if they need it. Then everyone goes back to the farm. Oh, I was like, what is this sentence I wrote? <laughs> also known as a rainier version of where I daydream about all being all the time. Because the farm is amazing, but oh. it's raining. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what am I talking about? Okay. Inside the farm, Mulder and Scully are invited to sit at dinner. It's a farm table with a dozen or so kindred. One guy is hacking away, which is awful in the best of times, but during a worldwide plague, I just about couldn't watch. (laughs) They're all passing around food as the guy coughs away, and Scully begins asking questions about the murders. She mentions that they have pictures, and Sister Abigail says the kindred don't allow pictures. So how did the shopkeepers get all of those pictures? Did they secretly take those very posed images that were framed in their shop? I guess so. They were they were just standing around like that naturally. Wow. And somebody just popped up and went... Ch-ch-ch. I guess I would take pictures of if two people were just posing. <laughs> I'd be like, well, that's what people are coming to my town for, so... Yep, and that's why every once in a while throughout the day, I'll just pose. Oh, really? Just in case. You never know who's taking a picture of you. Okay. You don't, actually. You don't know who's taking a picture of you. Yeah, so you gotta make it a good one. One time, I... 
had this thought and had to tweet it out on a now defunct Twitter handle. But how many pictures do you think you're in the background of? Oh, I hope it's a million. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I know that I'm in the background of a picture, I make sure that they eventually see me. What is this guy doing? <laughs> I have photobombed so many people in my life. What were you doing? Wafting your crotch smell at them? Yeah. Without my hands. <laughs> oh, God. You're just making everybody's family vacation photos obscene? Yep. Great. Brother Wilson... No, Wilton. <laughs> Brother Wilton slams his hand on the table saying, your world does not interest us. We have no need for your violence or your questions. I've said what is needed. They have no right to be here at this time. And knowing what we know about these people, you have no right to be here. You, you have no interest in our world? Then get off of it. <laughs> F you, Brother Wilton. <laughs> Sister Abigail is at the other end of the table from Brother Wilton and she stands. She says, Brother Wilton, stand. He does. Before we can accept any man's person, we must accept our own. And I ask, who can stand in your sight when once you are angry? I am ashamed to lift up my face, and I shall not be ashamed in this evil time. Make atonements for this wrath, Brother Wilton. Brother Wilton looks down. Mulder says, that's all right. He di we didn't take any offense. And Brother Andrew says, anger as violence is not tolerated. Our brother must be admonished. And uh, mean meanwhile... Brother Aaron is just choking to death at the table. They never admonish Brother Wilton. It seems like that was just a performance. Well, we're back at the dance club. No good. <laughs> a very pushy guy gets a woman to dance with him after doing the thumb rubbing thing, even though she says no. Yeah. And that's all that I wrote for this yeah. scene. All right, near the Kindred's property, the Kindred walk Mulder and Scully to a path leading back to their car. It's still raining, and they have lanterns. Mulder says the Adams family finds religion. Except the Adams family are fun and sex positive. Mm -hmm. I'd rather hang out with them. Yeah. It was nice of the Kindred to just give them some lanterns. Yeah. That was cool. And in any other scenario, the line, stay on the path. Would have been really creepy. Yeah. Not this scenario. Though. There's nothing in the woods to get them. Mulder says, I think it was all an elaborate act. And Scully says, what, the choking? Mulder says, no. All this simple life living from abundance crap. These people know something, Scully. You can see it in their eyes, the way they look at one another. They also know that there are no children around, and the people from the shop photos closely resembled some of the people at the table. So they sneak back to the farm where they find a ceremony occurring for the body of Brother Aaron. I wrote down orgy, funeral pyre, and nothing else. I didn't have a third one. No. Nope. Rule of threes didn't get to me on this one. No. Nope. Mulder is really down on the other, which is what the kindred are in this situation, for someone who's always the other in his own life. I think it's because he thinks it's irrational. He is irrational. No. His beliefs are in, you know, science and stuff. This is religion. I don't like it. I don't like how he's being here. Oh, no. I, I agree with you. I'm just, I think that's what he's where he's coming from. It's also another episode where Scully is being attacked oh, and yeah. targeted. Yeah. While Mulder's... I, don't know, I guess he's... Running around by himself without his partner. Yes. I guess he gets hit in the face once. He, he does. He doesn't get knocked out. But he falls down and then is paralyzed for he, a bit. He lays there like a rag doll. <laughs> we'll talk about that when we get there. Yeah. It's... Um, one thing that I do like about this shot, now that Mulder and Scully are back on the farm, is I like the shots through the slats of the barn. So the way that the camera is, we're seeing through the slats like we're looking through yeah. cracks in the, in the barn. Pretty good. Pretty good cinematography there. Mulder leaves Scully to investigate inside the cellar where they took Brother Aaron. Scully stays outside and gets found by Brother Andrew immediately, who tells Scully to come with him in exchange for information. True crime fans know... Never go to a second location. <laughs> I thought you were going to say never go to a second location. <laughs> Brother Andrew tells Scully he knows who the murderer is. It's Brother Martin, who we call Marty. He guesses that Marty poisons his victims. He then shows Scully some old glossy magazines Marty found and kept hidden. Apparently Marty was obsessed with what he calls your world. Marty left the kindred to become one of you. All very obvious tells when you know the air quotes twist at the end. Yeah. In this scene, Scully is asking questions and Brother Andrew doesn't answer a single question. None of the kindred 
ever answer a question. No, and Mulder does mention that, I think, when they're walking in the woods right before this part of the episode. He says something about how they never answered, and so I was paying attention, and Brother Andrew gets answers. He doesn't give information. Yep. So Scully is asking questions, but Brother Andrew decides that that's enough, and he takes her hand and rubs it with his thumb. Scully asks what he's doing. Brother Andrew moves closer and nuzzles her neck. Scully says no, but she's obviously confused or s- there's something going on, like he roofied her. And I hate this whole episode. Scully's body goes limp, and Andrew has no difficulty pushing her down on the bed, lying on top of her. Meanwhile, Mulder is screwing around on his own. He's in the cellar where the kindred are covering Brother Aaron in phlegm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The cellar is also the mine where the kindred get their sculpting material. He presses on a membrane inside the cave. It's weird. There's a lot of tactical stuff, and he looks like he's going to taste some evidence. Ah, he puts his fingers right in something and brings it so close to Mm -hmm. his mouth. I thought he was going to taste it. I actually liked the set design in here, even though it sort of, parts of it looked like an afghan knitted out of snot. Yes! (laughs) Yeah, I said this whole place is organic in a way that feels sticky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was very interesting, but it was also like I want to know what the cost for that set design was because that was cooler than the control room, the <laughs> yeah. command center, which blew the budget for everything. Uh, while poking around, he overhears a conversation alerting him that Scully isn't simply standing outside the barn waiting for him like he left her. She's alone in the house with Brother Andrew, and he rushes to her rescue, rattling the door and yelling at Andrew to get off of her. I skipped the part where he also found Brother Aaron's body that was covered in snot, and Brother Aaron was, air quotes, transforming by wearing the world's cheapest looking wig. It was terrible. It was god awful. So, oh, and then Brother Aaron opened his eyes. Right before he ran off. Mulder is leading Scully out of the house because she is just... She's very... Yes, she's out of it. Sister Abigail says, I asked you not to interfere. Now, at this point, they have left. So I assume they got the magazines for their guns back because they were leaving. And I am kind of surprised that Brother Andrew didn't get domed. He didn't even get... He got nothing. Yeah. Mulder did nothing. Oh, yes, he did. Mulder will start to accuse Scully of Uh, everything. Yeah. Because here's the next scene. Scully is still dazed as Mulder says, What the hell were you doing back there? Scully, in a weak voice, replies, I don't know. And Mulder says, You don't know? Yeah. Scully is still dazed. She uh, rushes away from Mulder to be sick. You know, that nauseous feeling you get when you've been drugged. Hmm. All right, back to the dance club, uh, which is <laughs> obviously the hunting ground. Marty is back in female form, picking up the worst dude ever. <laughs> Why is he talking on his phone in the middle of this club? There's no way that's a good conversation. No. And as he says, I'm on a conversation. <laughs> he was on a conversation, Marty. <laughs> on a conversation? He has to be related to the the twins mom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> who gave birth in San Rafael Hospital. <laughs> 4.42 p.m. That's right. I am on a conversation. <laughs> Marty does the thub rubbing thing, and I said RIP that guy. He doesn't actually die, but that's still where this is going. There's a little bit of trivia in this scene. The big painting shown a few times on the wall, the discotheque. <laughs> yeah, it looks uh, Geiger-esque. It is Geiger-esque. It is a copy of a painting by H.R. Geiger, <laughs> the Swiss artist who designed Alien. Thought so. Good catch. Near Steveston, Mulder has stopped at a diner and brings two cups of coffee back to the car, giving one to Scully and checking in on her. Although he does ask her why she didn't leave before he got that far, even though we've just established she doesn't remember anything. (sighs) And then Mulder says, maybe it's the sex that kills. And Scully says, do you think he was trying to kill me? Recognizing that Brother Andrew was about to rape Scully and still blaming Scully for all of this. Yeah. Now we're at a parked car, and I said, speaking of sex killing... David has questions about getting caught in cars by cops. <laughs> so go ahead. Oh. Here is your floor. Oh, I just, is this a thing that really happens? I don't understand it. It's such a trope in movies and TV shows. You're making out in a car and a cop knocks on the window. I, and I do not know if this is a real thing or not. Well, it happened in the, was it the last, last episode? Last episode, I think, yeah. The teenagers were making out. I know teenagers make out in cars. Well, I know people make out in cars. I don't. 
I don't know that they get <laughs> hassled by the cops for doing it. I don't know. I don't know, man. Well, there's this whole scene that's garbage and I don't like it. We're in the hospital where Michael from the club didn't actually die <laughs> and is exactly the person we knew he'd be from his actions in the club. <laughs> <laughs> Hustling in the club used to be so simple. Yeah. The first thing he says is, on a scale of 1 to 10, she was a kind 3. <laughs> and then it just goes downhill from there. He says, after the car, she looked like a man. And Scully says, she was a man. And there's some more transphobic dialogue that I didn't bother to write down because we're skipping it. And then there's the next scene where Mulder and Scully are walking through the hospital. And there's biphobic language again. So I skipped that also. They are alerted that a credit card has been used at a motel nearby. And that's where they're going. In the motel room, I have questions. There are all of these glossy images on the wall in a collage like I did when I was in college in my dorm room. <laughs> my roommate and I covered, like wallpapered our walls with pictures, but we lived there. Yeah. It wasn't a motel. <laughs> I think the implication might be the, no, cause it was a man that was the victim. Yep. So I don't know. Okay. Mulder and Scully break in to find Marty and her latest victim. Marty is monologuing about them finding her because the time is coming and they won't leave me behind. Which, again, once we get to the end, this starts to make sense. But we're supposed to believe that because it's a religious sect, well, we also know there's some sort of extraordinary things happening. Whatever. There's monologuing. We know that it's about to end. While Scully is inspecting the dead man, Marty hits her from behind. We get a transition of Marty from female... Well, hang on, because Scully gets knocked out again. Yep. That's number three so far in 14 episodes. I'm keeping count now. Okay. You're going to have a spreadsheet. Uh, we get the transition of Marty female into Marty male. And then what we do is Twa was her last name. I have to find his last name. Stebbing? Okay. So we get a, a picture of Kate Twa, and she looks to the left and then looks back and then turns into like, Peter Stebbings <laughs> and definitely has 30 pounds on her, <laughs> but is also six inches taller. So there's that transition, which was probably interesting to do with the technology back then, but also like, ugh, this whole episode. Anyway, Scully is not around to see this transformation because anytime anything extraordinary happens, she's not around. She's knocked out. There's a goof around minute 40 where Mulder and Scully break into the hotel room and a silhouette can be seen dropping down behind the window. Could be falling equipment or a crew member ducking out of sight. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, Scully... Oh, Scully runs... I didn't write any of this down. Scully runs out of the motel. I guess it's a hotel. The hotel down the stairs. This is where Mulder's in the hallway because he got turned into a rag doll. She goes outside and catches Marty who's wearing a sweatshirt and underwear uh, just outside in the <laughs> rain. It's raining still, or again. Yeah. Then the kindred show up. They appear. They appear, and they knock Scully out again. Yep. Number four. We got two in one episode. At this point, I am getting worried about her brain. Yeah. Uh, Brother Andrew punches her in the face. In this scene, when he got close enough to her, she she said, stop, I'm armed. But he was staring at her. So was he also, can they... Maybe residual. Residual pheromones? I guess. I mean, clearly they don't know how pheromones work in this episode because it's all touch. And pheromones are all smell, so... Uh, yeah. Larry Barber and Paul Barber. Uh, Not your favorites? No. I hate them, I actually. I think you should probably look into some other stuff that they've done before you just blanket statement. All right, so after this, the kindred come and take Marty away. They disappear in the shadows. Mulder checks on Scully because, yes, she's been knocked out again in the alleyway. And Mulder says they've blocked off a 10-block section and searched it all in one hour. And I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Mulder says, well, if they're not here, then then there's only one place that they would have gone. So he, they go back to the Kindred property near Steveston, and um, surprise, they were aliens all the time, the end. And I threw my notebook <laughs> when that <laughs> happened. Because, ugh, fucking aliens. You're going to have fun editing yourself. <laughs> Christian aliens. Yep. Christian aliens. <laughs> Christian aliens. 
in the worst crop circle I've ever seen. It was a bad crop circle. Ugh. So Mulder does, this scene is longer than just that, uh, but it doesn't matter. It's but, kind of not. It really isn't that much. He does open up the barn and it's filled with yeah, the, the clay. the tunnel that they... So it's kind of like, have you seen that, um, that foam that they use to stop fires? Like it hardens? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. It looked like that. It looked exactly like that, yeah. Like they uh, filled I, the place with I thought of Demolition Man when they get the car wreck. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's so hot here, guys, that the squirrels are all just laying on their bellies on everything. <laughs> I know that doesn't have anything to do with the X-Files, but we're, we're watching a squirrel and so are the cats. <laughs> and when I was out running, there, every time there was a fence post, just laying bellies, full bellies <laughs> on posts. Yeah. It's so hot. All right. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and tell you in this episode, I'm shipping n- up nobody. Nope. Nobody. Nobody gets love in this episode. Nobody. Nobody associated with this episode ever gets happiness ever. <laughs> oh my gosh. Nobody. You're wishing sadness and Ugh. isolation on everyone. When I when we finished this, when I watched it the first time, I told Riley that if I was watching this at the time and saw this episode, I probably would have quit watching the series. And he did ask us if we could just skip it. Yeah. Ugh. Hated it. Yeah. It's not. It's not great. Really, really. I can tell. Well, we don't want to go out on that note. Okay. So, what is... Well, how do you have a way to survive? Oh, God. Never go to that goddamn <laughs> nightclub. My way to survive this one is the same way I survive anything with aliens. Just do nothing. Because <laughs> that's that same stuff would have happened. They left when they were going to leave. Yeah. Mulder and Scully didn't affect this scenario at all. Again. I, yeah, this one this one was hard to watch because of the constant sexual assault and murder. Yeah, it's... So, palate cleanser. I looked up the soundtrack because I, I wanted something. I couldn't find anything for this. But do you have anything that's making you happy this week? <sighs> well, at 14 episodes, we have now lasted longer than... I had to go longer than because nobody gets canceled at 14 episodes. <laughs> it is a weird number. <laughs> <laughs> we have lasted longer than The Tortellis, which was a spinoff of Cheers, Carla's huh. baby daddy and his new family. Oh, okay. Do you remember anything about Cheers? Not really. Carla's ex, Nick Tortelli, was uh, uh, Cher's dad and Clueless. Okay. And he was a real scumbag. And Gene Kasem uh, played his wife. Okay. The tall blonde lady who's got the really high pitched voice. Yeah. Probably recognize her. Okay. Somewhere. And Billy, which was a spinoff of Head of the Class with Billy Connolly, my favorite Scottish comedian. Okay. Hello, geniuses! <laughs> he took over for Howard Hessman when Howard Hessman left the show and he became the teacher. And then that series got canceled and he got his own spinoff. Oh, okay. As the same character. And uh, his son was played by Jonathan Galecki. Oh, okay. Who went on to Roseanne and then Big Bang Theory. Yep. Figured that's a good palate cleanser. Yep. All right. Anything else for this episode? Got nothing. All right. We're out. The Cast Files is produced by Kristen Riley and Dave Reed. Edited by Dave Reed. You can find us on Twitter at Cast Files. You can find me on Twitter at Dave Reed. That's D-A-I-V-E-R-E-E-D. You can email us at thecastfiles, that's the with two e's, at gmail.com. If you could please go rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, give us five stars, and tell us that we are doing phenomenal things, artistic, wonderful things. We are raising the bar on podcasting. We would love you forever for that. We have a tea public store. You can go buy t-shirts and stuff there. Music by Hal Six. Logo by Atuka Art. That's O O K A A R T. 